Good morning, New Trail. Good morning. What a brisk and wonderful day this is bringing. The bright, is this on? Okay. You can hear me without this. As of today, it's 16 days counting today to Christ's birthday and Christmas Day. I sat here and wondered what's the best scripture that I can come up with in my heart about, hi, Sonny, I see that, uh, what Christmas is all about. And I come up with this scripture that he gave to us, our present, John 3.16. And it states if everybody should know it, and that... So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's quite a present. Amen. And uh, I just received a text from Haley Shore. She got bad news that uh, one of the Cowboys on the Fort Scott's uh, rodeo team committed suicide last night, and uh, the team is taking it pretty bad, especially this time of year, the pressures of everything. That's why we need to reach out. That's why we need, when we greet somebody, tell them Merry Christmas. I've seen this thing in the, on my Facebook a lot. It says, parents and grandparents take their kids and their grandkids to the mall to see Santa Claus. But why don't they take them to church to meet Jesus? All right, Pastor Stan, as you know, is uh, invisible here today, but he's here in spirit, but not body. He's out there gannivanting around in Las Vegas. As if some, huh? Just repeat what she said that nobody can hear it online. Okay, we said that uh, Pastor Stan's not here in body, but he's in in mine and Miss Beth just said that out there he's in Las Vegas at the National Finals Rodeo and he will be in church out there because the NFR puts in that they have three genres of uh, church services for the contestants and Stan's going to be in one of them. Every meeting he was in was opened by prayer. Amen. In Las Vegas, nevertheless. Amen. 
It starts right here, sister. Okay. Like I said, 16 days to Christmas. <coughs> this week on Wednesday, our prayer focus should be on our country of Israel. They're still in the battle of their life, and so are we. Uh, men's uh, Bible study, 9 a.m. tomorrow. And is there anything else? Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting about that. Mark your calendars, December the 15th, 16th, and 17th. Reggie and Carolyn will have hot drinks and cookies on their back porch, which you finally got pretty well done. And that, to enjoy the light display, which he has not finished counting his lights yet. I'm not done until I take them down. And... From 5 to 7.30. There you go. Christmas evening service is at 5.30 on Sunday. And let's worship in praise. Okay, we'll go ahead and light our Advent candle. Today we light this candle, remembering that Jesus, our great high priest, secured peace for us, not just in our daily lives, but for forever. Father, as we light the peace candle today, we thank you that you gave us Jesus to be our peace. We praise you for sending your son to take on our sin and shame and pay the price we never could so that we could be with you forever. Because of Jesus, nothing in this world can ultimately harm us, for we have salvation in you. We pray this in your precious son's name. Amen. Well, if anyone didn't have their eyes closed, you saw there was not peace lighting that peace candle. <laughs> Something we're going to have to work on at our house. Okay. Let's go ahead and stand up and begin worship. Rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How God in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. And when they came from Bethlehem, where our dear Savior lay, they found him in a manger, where oxen feed on hay. His mother Mary, kneeling down unto the Lord, did pray, Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh, tidings of Comfort and joy. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. 
can be seated. I got it, I think. Well, good morning, New Trail. How's everybody? Y'all ready for Christmas? I know we're behind the curve at our house. We're behind the curve on Christmas. But I know you guys are all ready for it. You bought everything. You've done everything. And you're just, you're just waiting now, right? <coughs> oh, something sounded funny to somebody. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we we to a class here just a few moments ago and the people that were in there. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, and, and you know, brother was up here, he mentioned that we celebrate uh, Jesus' birthday today. It's not Jesus' birthday on the 25th of December. It's probably around April, March or April sometime. But what we are doing is doing a celebration of that birth. Okay, and that needs to be our focus. We need to be careful of watching out out there. That we don't get inundated with the things of this world. That we don't become overcome with all the hype and everything out there. But we keep our focus on Jesus Christ. We, we just, we've just got to do that. Uh, as Brother Dave said, Brother Stan is, in the, is out in Las Vegas. Or Las Vegas uh, for the rodeo. I've been watching him on the rodeo. Looks like him and him and Bryce are having a pretty good time out there. And that's good. I'm glad. So you got to put up with me for another day up here. Okay? Um, we talked a little bit about uh, a little bit about the offering in Sunday school class. Uh, the Old Testament the Old Testament Hebrews were told to give 10%. That was the that was a Hebrew tithe to God. We're not required to give a tithe, but we're required to give, to give. And I want you to understand that when you're giving, you're not giving for anything, but you're giving to the church. You're giving to God. God will use that money however He sees fit. But I do encourage you to give. I do encourage you to forgive because uh, we've come a long way since we were over in the barn and a really long way since you, you started over, what was it, King Solomon Camp where you started over there? Was that right? There ain't no old timers in here. Was it King Solomon Larry? Larry's been here since dirt. Okay, so. Okay, yeah. We've come a long way from there. Uh, if you want to stay in this long way, I, I, would, I would suggest that you, you search your heart, talk to God, and uh, give appropriately to keep us going. Keep the church. I mean, when I say us, I don't mean me, you, or anybody else. I mean the church. To provide a place for you to be. To provide training materials for you. To provide camera back there, the organ up here, the, the, everything that's in here. You could be standing outside in the cold right now. Wouldn't that be fun? I guarantee you there'd be some hallelujahs going on. <laughs> okay. That's right. A lot of light out there. So think about that. Uh, I didn't get up here to preach a sermon on giving today, uh, although I think we probably do need one somewhere along the way. need to understand what we, what we have to give. But what I'm up here today is, is to celebrate Jesus Christ, to celebrate his coming, to celebrate what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us, and to never, ever, ever forget that. Sometimes we do forget. So let us, let us keep in mind, it's a trite saying, let us keep in mind the reason for the season, okay? And for us, it is Jesus Christ. Uh, let's pray over the, the offering that we're about to take, and uh, I'll let you all get back to singing. You sound so good. Father, we do thank you for this day. We just thank you for bringing us together, Lord. We thank you that we can come here and we can worship you in truth and, that, and in the spirit, Lord, 
And we just thank you for your sending of your son, Jesus Christ. And we want to celebrate that this year, Lord. We want to celebrate Jesus Christ coming as one of us, not coming as a powerful king, not coming as a God, part of God, but coming as one of us, as a man, and suffering what we suffered and, and going to that cross in our stead. So that's what we give, want to give thanks for this morning, Lord. Uh, so help us to keep our focus on that throughout this Advent season of the year, and, and not just this Advent season of the year, but we should make everything a, an Advent season that we're appreciative of what Jesus came, what he did, and what he's going to do in our lives. And so now, Father, I just ask that you would bless the, the offering this morning. You would bless the hands that are putting money in to keep your church afloat, Lord. It's your church, Lord, and, and just touch hearts out there and bring a blessing upon those who give today. And bless, bless the giving, Lord. Bless whatever is taken in and multiply it for your use in your kingdom. And so, Father, we just want to thank you and praise you and give you all the honor and the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
think so much about the baby and we just have to remember who that baby became and what that baby ultimately did for us and he didn't stay that baby he grew into a man a man who was willing to bear all of our sins past future and present Scared me for a minute. I was going to go up You're against the wall. Huh? Yeah. You're not under arrest. Oh, really? No. You just need a little adjustment. Woo. I always need a little adjustment. I don't know what this thing is. Looks like a bug up there in front of me. Come on. Ah, I am on. Thank goodness. Well. Sorry, folks, but, you know, they give you a pair of glasses and you can't read with them. I'll tell you, the reading glasses, if I want to stand back here, I can probably read it. You can't hear me? All right, good. Thank you, Brother Dave. The Lord will reward you adequately. <laughs> well, I do like to sit down. People in my Sunday school class will tell you. I got my little stool in there. It, uh, used to belong to Pastor Stan, but he, he gave it up. And then Brother Reggie here did some modification to it and made it an actual stool. 
because I used to get up and the seat would fall off. But um, last week, uh, Pastor Stan did a, a uh, sermon on Jesus' as prophet. And he did a, did a fine job of covering it, in my opinion. And uh, the reason that these are important, my wife and I got a book uh, some time back that we thought we could use somewhere along the way. And, and it's a, it is an Advent book, but it's, it even includes the lighting, the candles and everything. But it, it goes into detail about four offices that Jesus fulfilled when he came to this earth. One was a prophet. One was a high priest. One is a king. And one is a very, very important offices. And so that we, we decided we would do that leading up to Advent. Cover those four things. So as I said, Pastor Stan did, uh, did uh, the prophet last week. And this week... Uh, I'm going to look at the high priest aspect of that. And then uh, a little bit further on for the remaining two weeks will be, of course, the king and the Messiah. Uh, probably Pastor Stan will do those, uh, as he should. But I'm doing today. And I, 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 for, I uh, really look forward to doing this because uh, I don't believe we've ever done this in the past that I can recall. But I think it's good. And what we're going to be looking at is, uh, is Hebrews. And Hebrews 7, chapter 7, verses 26 through chapter 8, verse 5. Okay. Give you a second to, to find your place there. Whether you be on your phone or in, your, in the Word itself. Not that the Word's not on your phone. Uh, Hebrews 7, 26 through 8, 5. Chapter 7, verse 26 to chapter 8, verse 5. Got it? All right. Let's just read that and just kind of follow along with me. You may have a different version of mine. Uh, I'm using the, uh, the uh, uh, English Standard Version. Of the Bible. Verse 26, for it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, and undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. Because he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both their gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Now these last words in Hebrew 5, 8, 5 that we see here, so that you see all the things according to the pattern that you're showing you on the mountain. That's a quote straight from Exodus 25, 40. Uh, God was speaking to Moses at, in, this, in this word here. And 
we have to understand that God was giving Moses all the layout on, on making a priesthood, on making a tabernacle, on, on consecrating all this stuff. And, and God had a plan. I know that's a little hard to believe, right? That God's got a plan? Yeah, he had a plan. Now, most of the people that were involved in this plan didn't know anything about it. But he was going to use these people. Uh, he even, God even showed to Moses the furnishings that were supposed to be in the tabernacle, uh, the, the actions and, and everything else that were to take place to dress the priest, sanctification of the priest, uh, qualifying them to stand up and speak for God. It's called ordination. They were to be ordained. Now, man has taken that a little bit further in, in so much as we have our, all of our de denominations have an ordination into that denomination. However, there's only one ordination. That's the ordination under Jesus Christ, which he has ordained each and every one in here to be of a royal priesthood. Okay. Now, we've got to understand something about this. Uh, you look back up there in the first part of that, 5, verse 5 there, or there, it says, who serve a copy, copy, and a shadow of heavenly things. Well, what do they mean that? The reality of our worship is not here on earth. The reality of our worship is in heaven. We're just here. We're just walking through this world. We're nothing but a vapor. We're nothing but something that God uses here if we allow ourselves to be used. But God gave Moses a pattern for the priestly sacrificial, sacrificial system. He didn't just make this up on the spot and he said, hmm, what can we do? Uh, yeah, hey, let's make a priest. No, he had this all planned out as to how he was going to appoint priests. They were going to fulfill that priestly ministry. They would have a sacrificial system to patter it after the reality that exists in heaven. So when we look at the priesthood, we get a glimpse into God and his ways when we look at how he ministered to the nation of Israel. Okay? Oh, okay. I thought maybe the Lord was telling me to shut up. <laughs> um, now let's, let me, let me just kind of uh, illustrate that a little bit to you. Uh, I, I know we're, you're not children, uh, but you got, uh, most of you have had children. Now, say, let's say that you go, say you go to West. Yeah, well, man, I guess I don't know. Uh, say you go to West and you're a kid, and there's some things in West that kind of get your eyes as a child. They call it those flashy displays they put out there. And while they have a 20-cent toy they're selling for $3, but you got to, what, have it. And so as you're going through with your mother or your father, whoever you're going through with, it draws your attention. And after a while, you go, okay, you stay here and look, I'm going on. And the kid is all wrapped up in that until all of a sudden they realize they're alone. And they panic. They absolutely panic. And they'll start to cry. In fact, we, we lost my son down in, uh, down in Oklahoma City one time at the Children's Museum down there. And couldn't find him, so we, we got a hold of one of the people out there. And they said, well, we'll call up front. And uh, they said, we think we found him, but we're not sure. So I went to get him, and I said, son, how come you couldn't tell him who you are? They said, well, we asked him who he was. And then we thought we'd ask for a way we could get a hold of you. And we said, son, who, what do you call your daddy? He said, daddy? He said, I couldn't just say, well, someone who is called daddy, come up and get your child. So... 
we're, we're kind of like that. We want somebody to help us. We want, we really want our mother or father to come and help us. And, and we're just kind of panic here, and we don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, down at the end of that aisle, we see this shadow or a reflection or something, and it looks like mom. Oh, there's mom. There's mom. Well, which is better, seeing that reflection of mom or having the reality of mom? Step around the corner and say, you're safe. We're safe. I'm, I'm here. I'm not going to leave you. Get that through your head. We can look at the, the shadow or the reflection of Jesus Christ, and, and we should. However, we have to look at the real thing. We have to, we have to take into account what he left us. His word. And we have to know about him. And when we do look on the reality of Jesus Christ, that's when Jesus Christ becomes our high priest. Brothers and sisters, that's what Christmas is. Christmas is the replacement of of shadow things with the real thing. We don't have to wonder, is that, is that, is that Jesus there? I can't tell. I can't see too well because Jesus is never going to be hidden from you. He's got a real thing, and he's going to be there for you. So I would ask you, this, this season, let your heart be turned to Jesus Christ. Now, it's very easy to get sidetracked, as I told a class in there this morning. It's easy to fall into the trap of commercialism out here. I think uh, a lot of you have television. We don't have television. But uh, a lot of you have television. What are you inundated with on television? Ads, commercials. Buy this, buy this. And they, they gear it toward whom? Your children. All of a sudden, like I told them, my kids even getting catalogs, they wake up about a two toilet paper roll length of a Christmas list. So I have to cut it down a little bit because I, I, would, I don't think Trump could buy everything that they want for Christmas. <laughs> he would be in the poorhouse. But we need to stop looking at that. It's okay to give people gifts at Christmas. It's, it, it's fine as long as it's given with the heart that I want to bring something, just like Jesus brought something to us. And it didn't cost him a penny. It didn't cost you a penny, but it was given freely. And I, I feel that when I give gifts to my kids and to other people. I don't have to give them, but it's, it's the joy of doing that that matters. I, I honestly don't care if I get a thing as long as I can see my kids and people around me be happy. So, when we look at Hebrews 8, 2 is kind of a summary, 8, uh, 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2. That's kind of a summary statement of everything. So, so, now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary, and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. God will not live in a man-made tabernacle. He cannot. You can't contain him. Will he visit? Yeah, absolutely he does. He keeps eye on us. He watches us. But he doesn't live here. lives here that's the true church right here not in these chairs as nice as it is in this building as nice as it is but right here so we need to prepare our church this year to receive Jesus Christ and it says that Jesus is set down at the right hand of God that's a singular honor to sit down at the right hand of God. God considers that Jesus has 
been perfected. He is perfected, and he is, he is able to sit down at the right hand of God, and he's in the presence of God. He, he, in, he's, in, he's in part of the throne of majesty in the heavens, in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle. It says pitched by the Lord, not by man. That's who you serve. That's the king you serve. Now, let me go just one little bit further. The main point of it is that the one who, the one priest who goes between us and God and makes us right with God and prays for us to God is not an ordinary, weak, sinful, dying priest like in the Old Testament days. He is the Son of God, strong, sinless, with eternal life. Not only that, but he's also ministering in, not ministering in an earthly tabernacle of a place, size, and wearing out, being moth-eaten, being soaked, burned, torn, and stolen. It happens every day in our man-made tabernacles we call the church which we really should be saying, our meeting place or our, our gathering place. I don't know. i tell you what, my fingers, my fingers just don't work anymore. Three, I'm hoping that's four. It says that Christ is ministering to us in a true tabernacle. Again, what the Lord pitched and not man. The real thing is in heaven. What was on Mount Sinai was a shadow that Moses copied. According to verse 1, another great thing about that reality, which is greater than the shadow, is that our high priest is seated at the right hand of the majesty or the God, the Father, in heaven. No old priest, Old Testament priest could claim that. He had a, a place of honor by the Father. Jesus deals directly with the Father. Our shadow reality, even the Hebrews' shadow reality, it had curtains. Y'all remember the curtain? We talked a little bit about the curtain this morning. Very thick, very thick curtain. Wasn't just a curtain like on your windows, very heavy. Took a lot to set it up. But when Jesus became our sacrifice, it was ripped top to bottom. The the curtain, no, oh, I'm sorry. I'm drying out up here. We're we're finally using something I think we didn't realize we had in our house called a heater. Uh, and it's drying me out. <laughs> Y'all hear that? <laughs> uh, I've learned one thing. You don't drink out of that cup, huh? Sound effects. Sound effects. Even, even, the, even the Hebrews, you know, they, they were told to have the curtains, the bowls for the offering and the bowls for washing, tables. What's one table that we all... Oh. Well, I've got so many people out there watching me, I can't sneeze up here. Uh, there's one table we always see a lot of in the Bible, and that's a showbread table. We always, excuse me, see about that. But then they had robes that they had to wear, and those robes had to have tassels on them, and they had an ephod that they wore that had to have all the stones in it. And we talked about that. That was about a 60 or 70-pound vest that they had on because these weren't little tiny jewels these were big jewels they had in there and it, made, it was also set in gold which gold is a metal and it is heavy this was the ultimate and final reality God and his son interacting in love and holiness for our eternal salvation The superior priesthood. 
The reality of the persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in relationship to dealing with each other, concern how the majesty, holiness, love, justice, and goodness, and truth is manifested in redeemed people. Did you get that? And you're going to have to let the Holy Spirit manifest these through you. Now, you can go out there and you can put the words out there. Oh, yeah, I got baptized the other day. You know, I grew up in the 50s, and I used to hear that all the time. Because people in the 50s who weren't born-again believers figured if they got baptized, they were good to go. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can always hear them. Oh, I got baptized the other day. Well, what do you know about Jesus? Who? Uh, I don't know. I, mean, I got baptized. I'm going to heaven. Sorry about that. Sorry you believe that way. You have to be redeemed. You got to be redeemed. Now, I want to tell you something about what we just talked about, about Jesus having, having a seat beside the Father in heaven, talking directly to God. Can I tell you something? If you are a born-again believer, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are covered by the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ, guess what you have access to? You have access to the throne room of God. You can go there and you can say, Father, I'm here. Jesus, cover me with the blood, the blood of your sacrifice. And you can walk into that throne room and you can talk to God. You have direct contact with God. And then God says, okay, have a seat over here beside my son. Do you get that? God gives you a seat by Jesus Christ. If that don't raise a hair on your arm, something's wrong. If I don't hear amen out there, I better hear uh-oh. <laughs> amen, that is an amazing thought, folks. We know where Jesus is at. We've known that. People talk about it. Pastors talk about it. But you know, you're there too. You are there. That don't mean you're equal to God. Don't get me wrong because there are pastors out there who will tell you, I'm, I, you know, me and God, we're pretty much the same. <laughs> we are what the Bible calls, as, as Marge so aptly pointed out, called what, Marge? Little, little gods with a little letter. That don't mean that we're gods. That means that we have the capacity to call on God. But as a true believer, and anybody can call on God, even those who aren't saved, but it's the ones who are saved, the ones who have decided to follow Jesus, who have done what Jesus told them to do. Take up your cross daily and follow me. We have to take up our cross daily. It's not a once and for all thing. I mean, you don't sit there and profess, profess Jesus Christ and walk away going, I'm good to go, got my get out of hell free ticket. But a lot of people think that way, brothers and sisters. Every day we've got to take up these things that beset us and turn them over to God and say, here I am, I'm ready. I've cleaned myself up. I, I'd ask you to, to come in and just wash me clean, Lord. I'm giving up all this stuff that, that, that whatever I did yesterday, uh, say I talked bad about somebody without thinking about it, and ask forgiveness for it. And I said, you know, just Holy Spirit, just will help me to walk away from that. Help me not to talk bad about people. Even if they're not there, it's better to talk bad about them while they're there because that's pretty honest anyway. But we've got to, we've got to, we've got to think that way. Now, there's five superiorities to the priesthood of Jesus. The very first thing, Jesus was sinless and is sinless. Verse 26 says, we have a high priest who is holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. No other priest in existence could ever say that. They were all sinful, sinful people just like you and me. 
not Jesus. He was tempted. He was tempted in every way. Just as we're tempted, he said, I had the same temptations you had. That's a little bit of a paraphrase. I don't think Jesus is going to get after me for that because that's exactly what he did. He said, I was tempted like you. There's nothing new under the sun. But I overcame it. You can overcome it too through me. He was tempted, but he never once yielded to that sin. Second, because he was sinless, he didn't have to offer a sacrifice for himself like the priest did. Remember I said the priest had to offer a sacrifice for themselves before they could offer sacrifices for the Israeli nation? What he did was offered himself as the eternal sacrifice. Verse 27 says, he does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices. First for his own sin and then for the sins of the people because he did once for all when he offered up himself. Christ was radically different from other priests. They had to deal with their own sins before they could deal with the sins of the people. And I can guarantee you, it never once in a million years entered their mind that they could actually be a sacrifice for other people's sin. Why would you think that would be? Because what does the word say about sacrifice for sin? And blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. They went through a lot of priests if that worked that way. That's why they used cattle, goats, sheep, birds. But doing this this way, he is the sacrifice. And the word says, once for all. That should be significant to you. One time for all. Now, does that mean everybody in the world is saved? No. Does it mean everybody in the world can be saved? Yes. The offering is there. The invitation is there. It's up to people who have a free choice from God to come or not. And when people say, why would a loving God send people to hell? He doesn't. God sends no one to hell. You sin yourself. You either accept Jesus Christ or you don't. And those who do not know Jesus, who have not received his forgiveness and the washing of his blood, are not his children. And they are doomed for hell. I don't know any other way to say that. I don't know how to sugarcoat it. I don't think there is any sugarcoating. It's up to us, folks. It's up to us. Because he did it once for all. This he did once for all when he offered himself up. Now the term once for all is actually a, a, a Greek word. It's called, a, the Greek word is epipax, epipax, epipax. And it means once for all. Uh, it's a direct, direct uh, translation. This makes Jesus the center of history. The world doesn't look at it that way because why? Because the world is dealing with a humanistic society out here now. And they want ever to be thing to be on a humanist nature. Uh, you know, uh, uh, 200 million years ago, uh, man was first brought on the earth by, by the uh, Anunnaki. That's where we came from. Huh? I didn't read that in my book. So it's out there. And they believe this, this stuff because they don't know Jesus. But Jesus is the center of our history. Every work of God's grace in history before the sacrifice of Christ looked forward to the death of Christ as its foundation. 
The death of Christ is a foundation of Christianity. And every work of God's grace since the sacrifice of Christ looks back at the death of Christ for its foundation. We've got to understand that everything that happens is to the good to us today. Everything God does to change us would not happen unless we had that sacrifice. That perfect sacrifice. Christ is the center of the history of grace. And you are living, brothers and sisters, under grace. There is no grace without Jesus Christ. Grace was planned from all eternity. But not without Jesus Christ as its center and his death as the foundation. Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.9 that God's grace was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. It's not new. God had a plan from before he ever made this world, before he ever created time, before anything. That's his plan. The fourth superiority of Christ over other priests is they were appointed by the law. Christ wasn't. He was appointed as a divine, by a divine oath as a perfect son. The perfect son of the Father. Verse 8 says, says, The law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son. The oath he's referring to is in Psalms 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You might remember the, 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 what happened with Melchizedek. That was uh, uh, Abraham came upon, this, uh, uh, came upon this man in his travels for, to where God sent him. And his name was Melchizedek, the king of Salim. Salim. Or Salam. Whichever you want to say, Salim, Salam. Uh, they both mean different things, but they both mean the same thing. Um, and and Melchizedek, the the Bible, the Old Testament refers to him as a true priest of the Most High God. Well, Hebrews, uh, Hebrew nation hadn't even been formed yet. And you got a high priest of the most high God out there. But king of peace. Thank you, Margie. That's also what Melchizedek means, king of peace. And what was Jesus? King of peace. I truly believe that Melchizedek was what is called a Christophany, where Jesus comes in human form but not to stay. But he came for a reason, to establish something. And you know what was established there at that? Yeah, it was, it was the priest. It was a picture of the priesthood, but it was something else, the tithe. Because what did Abraham do? Abraham gave one-tenth of everything he had to Melchizedek because he saw him as a true priest of the Most High God. Now, you've got to remember, you think, well, Abraham gave him a few dollars. Abraham gave him 10% of everything he had. Abraham had hundreds of sheep, hundreds of camels, hundreds of cattle. He had servants. He had gold. He had riches. Abraham was not a, was not a homeless guy. He was very, very rich, and he gave Melchizedek 10% of that. That established the tithe. And that's just a beginning number. 10% is just a beginning number. Jesus was appointed. That's the fifth superiority. His ministry does not pass away. What happened to the, to the priesthood? 
had died. They're trying to re make a resurgence of it now. Well, I kind of question why. Because, well, because they're, they're Orthodox Jews that are still trying to revive the priesthood. But the, the, the a, uh, Messianic Jews believe in Jesus Christ. Totally. The fifth part priority of Christ over the priests and his ministers forever. At the end of verse 28, it says, this oath appoints a son made perfect forever. Jesus never dies. He never has to be replaced. He has indestructible life. He'll outlive everybody who's against him. So if you don't know Jesus right now, you are against Jesus Christ. And guess what? He's going to outlive you. Earthly outlive you. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you if you don't know Jesus right now and you don't get to know Jesus. When the time comes, some will be going to heaven and some will be going to hell. Now, however, here's the, th here's the fun thing. Everybody gets a new body. Saints and sinners. We get to take our new bodies and live with Jesus Christ in perfection. Worshiping him every day in every way. And sinners get to go to hell with their indestructible, never die body into a lake of fire. And die on a daily basis to be consumed but never burned up. To have, as the word says, a fire that cannot be quenched. Nothing else alone in this world would make me want to look to Jesus Christ and make sure that he's who he says he is. Now, is that a get out of hell free card? Yeah, that is. But you've got, you got to turn things over to, to Jesus, and then he will make it something different. Okay. There are people out there right now that are, they're so afraid that if mommy and daddy die, who's going to take care of them? And usually we, th we would say this would be little kids. However, it, it goes on up to grown-ups. And we'll get questioned about it. Uh, and then sometimes we as parents fret that we won't be there to take care of our children. <laughs> Especially in my case. I was 56 years old when we took those two munchkins that hang around with me. We took them in, and my wife and I talked, and we both came, said the same thing. God is telling us to adopt. And we did. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I hope I'll be around for a while to see them grow up. So, But it's okay. We're not always going to be there. But that's why this truth is so Precious Jesus will not leave you, will not desert you, will not die on you, will never give up on you. And I may, you may give up on your children. Because it says in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, but without sin. Not for 10 years do we get redemption. Uh, with, the, with the Hebrews, it was one year with a sacrifice. Excuse me. Uh, animal sacrifice, one year, freedom from sin. Of course, as somebody in the class, I think it's Marge, pointed out, the minute they walked away from the from the sacrifice, it already started sinning again. Uh, it's not for one year. It's not for ten years. It's not for a hundred years. It's not for a thousand years. But it is forever. If you know Jesus Christ, His forgiveness is forever. If you want to think about how uncertain your life is. Think about that. And what's that? What's that, sir? But what is that? Your life with Jesus. And what does it say about Jesus? He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He doesn't change. 
I've heard so many times pastors stand up and say, well, you know, I don't like to use that Old Testament because God was really after him there in the Old Testament. I mean, he, he killed people. Yeah, he did. Because there was no sacrifice. And so we had people who would err, who would grievously sin, bring, to, bring stuff on God that God did not do. And yes, he, 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 cleared, he cleared the air. But we have Jesus now. Jesus has paid all that bit. So when we look at the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8, we have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who came in this world as the Son of God, lived a sinless life, offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for the sins of his people. Not just the Jews, but his people. Because the word says, I will make unto myself a people who are not a people. Which means, yeah, <laughs> you can come. I came for you guys. You know, I came for you, you Hebrews, you Jews. But not a lot of you are coming. So I'm going to look beyond this, and I'm going to get some people who are not a people and make them a people. And they're going to love me and they're going to trust me. He rose to, rose to everlasting life to the right hand of the majesty of God. And he loves us, prays for us, and tells us to do one thing. What is that? Draw near to God through him. He is our intercessor. Not some priest sitting in a confessional booth. But Jesus Christ himself is our high priest. He didn't come to fit into that system of priestly sacrifices. He came to fulfill an end them. You recall what he said in, in, in the temple. I come not to destroy the law, but to what? Fulfill it. I'm going to take care of the whole law for you right here I'm going to take your punishment I'm going to go to that cross I'm going to die for your sins I'm going to make the law null and void because I've done all this and I'm not going to change I'll be your sacrifice forever he is reality the shadow and a copy of this what we're in now is just a shadow and a copy of, real, of reality. And when reality comes, shadows are passed away. So we should be worshiping Jesus for who he is. Our Lord, our King, our, our High Priest, our Prophet, our Savior. All these things. And we have to, we have to really... Dedicate a life to worship, okay? The high priesthood of Jesus to come into reality instead of the shadow fulfills and ends a physical center of Old Testament worship. It did away with the physical side of it. It fulfills and ends the sacrificial offerings. It fulfills and ends dietary laws. It fulfills the, and ends having to wear a different uniform. This is my uniform. This is my priestly robe right here. It's whatever God tells me to wear. It, it, it fulfills and ends what happens in the Jewish faith. Those have seasonal acts of atonement and reconciliations. The Feast of Trumpets, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, the Harvest Feast. It goes on and on. There's a whole bunch of them. They have to fulfill those. We don't have that because Jesus has already taken care of that. He took care of it all. Praise God. I'm so glad he took care of it because I ain't worth a hoot in that area. And I'll tell you something else. You ain't either. I love y'all, but you ain't worth a hoot in that. Okay? It's a spiritual thing, not an external thing. You've got to have a spiritual outlook on your life and the lives of those around you. I, my, one of my fervent prayers is that everybody sitting in this room right here today 
at some point will come and be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about the baptism of water. You're baptized when you first accept Jesus Christ. You receive the Holy Spirit in you. Secondly, you must be baptized with the Holy Spirit to be completely filled with the Holy Spirit, running over, spread out to those around you. That's not the water baptism. That's the spirit baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's how we draw near to God. Because then he can work with you. You get rid of all the stuff you carry in here. You get rid of the ash and trash. God can work. It's hard for him to work around a whole bunch of stuff here that's tacked around. Take them old drawings down. Take down, your, take down your velvet Elvis and throw it in the trash, okay? Take down your dogs playing cards up there, throw it in the trash. The only thing you should have in there is the Holy Spirit. Everything was taken care of by Jesus. We don't have to worry about that. That's why we don't have to worry about priests. We don't have to worry about the temple. We are the temple. We're the temple of God. That's not just right now when we're sitting in here on the Lord's Day. It's all the time, everywhere. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. All. All the time. All the places. Everywhere. The way you act. The money. Paul talked in Philippians about the money that was sent to him while he was in prison. And in Philippians 4.18, it says it was a fragrant aroma, acceptable, sacrifice, pleasing to God. Why was that pleasing to God? Why was it a sacrifice? Why was it a fragrance? Because they gave it willingly to support the ministry, to support him out there in passing the word of Jesus Christ along to people. You can't do it on an empty stomach. That's why it was pleasing to God because of it, what it was intended for and what it was used for. We're not, we're not serving a shadow and a copy. We're serving. We're not serving religious objects. That's why you don't see a cross up here. I love the cross. And everything that we do should bring us back to that cross for the redemption of Jesus Christ. But the cross is empty. The cross, Jesus, Jesus is not there anymore. Unless you're Catholic. He's still up there. In my world, he's not there. He, he's gone on. And he's waiting on you. He's saying, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take upon you my yoke. For my, my load is not heavy and my yoke is light. He, he's going to do that for you. Sir, take up your cross. So we don't have a requirement for any of this stuff. We have it because God in his graciousness and his infinite mercy allowed us to have this place, allowed us to have what we have, allowed us to come in here in a warm place and worship him. And I, I, I really believe that anybody that comes in that door, their heart is not turned to the worship of God. Should go. And, and what, is, what does the word say about that? Jesus said, if you come to the sacrifice and you have anything against your brother, Leave your sacrifice, go take care of it, and then come back. We ought to start thinking the same way. Before I walk in this building, do I have something against somebody? Have I done something against somebody? I can't go in there until I go do this. Not because this is such a holy place, but I'm going to be standing in front of a holy God. The act of getting together as Christians in the New Testament to sing or pure, pray or hear the word of God, it was never once called worship in the New Testament. Not once. And so I, sometimes I think we distort what we talk about as worship. Our worship should be our hearts tuned to God. Our hearts open for God. Our asking God to be in our heart. Our asking God to take care of us. 
Yes. Honor and praise. We need to hear the word of God. Yes. That's why I love to stand up here. I love nothing better than speaking the word of God. It, it, just, it just makes me want to say, okay, God, come on. I'm ready. Let's go home. But all of this makes us free. And sometimes freedom's not a great thing. Because we get free and then we worry. God says we're not supposed to be worried and something else we're not supposed to be. You ever know what that is? You've read it a dozen times if you read it in the Bible. When an angel comes or the Lord comes, what's the first thing they say? Be not afraid. Be not afraid. You can't be. Why would you be afraid of Jesus? I don't understand that. If you know him, you love him, and you're going to follow him, what is there to fear? You bring it all upon yourself. We get so tied up in tradition. We shouldn't be tied up in tradition. It's good to have tradition. Trust me. You know, we, we always create our own conditions, don't we? we? Everybody has a time when they get up on Christmas Day. They have a way of opening toys like our kids. We have the Christmas Eve service. They go home, they get to open one toy. Then they get to bake some cookies. You know, and, and then they go to bed. That's been our tradition for 56 years. Something like that. <laughs> a week or two. Um, but we're, we're, that's a cultural shaping. That's not what God tells us to do. Uh, our commandment, our commandment is, is a radical connection. It's a radical connection of love, a radical connection of trust, a radical connection of obedience to Jesus Christ in all aspects of our life. We've got to remember something. Jesus didn't come here as some mamby, pamby little guy. Jesus came as a revolutionary. Jesus came to stir things up. And he said that. He said, I come to bring father against son, son against father, daughter against mother, mother against daughter. He knew it was going to happen. Yeah. But I got to say, you know, Jesus was, everybody talks about Jesus with the blonde hair. and the, He was Jewish. Dark hair, dark eyes, dark skin. He was born a Jew, raised a Jew, lived as a Jew, died as a Jew, went to heaven as a Jew, and guess what? The Jew's coming back pretty soon. You better get ready for it. So we need to love, trust, and obey him as, as to the best we can do. So you see, I divide these two books of the Bible into two different books. Yeah. Old Testament, New Testament, right? No. What I say is, this testament here without the red letters, what is that? The Old Testament? What else is it? If you, if you think a minute, you'll know. But I'm not going to make you measure on. This says... This tells us, this sets the stage. The whole Old Testament sets the stage for one thing. The coming of Jesus Christ. The laying out of how it's going to work when Jesus comes. You can't dismiss the Old Testament. It's there for a reason. You know, I, I tell folks, when you're reading the Bible and it says, therefore, you better take notice of it. You need to find out what it's there for. There's a reason. What we have was just a Bible to prepare the way in the Old Testament. And you know what the New Testament is? It's a missionary document. It explains our mission in life, how, why we have a mission. It's a radical spirituality of worship to Jesus Christ in that New Testament, and the reason, like I said, it's a missionary doctrine. The, me, 
the meaning of this book is to be preached to every person on earth and established in every culture in the world. That's why our high priest came, ended the tabernacle, sacrifices, feasts, vestments, dietary laws, circumcision, and priesthood. Old Testament was a come and see religion, and the New Testament is a go and tell religion. And to make possible, and make that possible, Son of God did not abolish worship, but made it a radical spiritual engagement with God through Christ Jesus that can and must happen in every culture around this world. Worship should not be trivialized, and it is not a trivialized in the New Testament. It's intensified, deepened, and made the radical fuel and goal of all missions. That is, the New Testament is your mission statement. You are a missionary. Don't forget that. The minute you walk out that door, people are going to say, they're coming out of church. Let's see how they act. And then you run down here to the corner store, uh, down there just, uh, just off of uh, Buckeye, and you pull up to the door where it's got the, looks almost like a beer bottle on the, on the window there. So you pull in there and get you a six-pack. <laughs> and they say, oh, yeah, that's a Christian for you. That's the way they are. They've been up there talking in their church, and now they're down here getting them something to drink. No. We have freedom of worship. It's, like I said, a, a, a missionary mandate. But it's kind of scary, too. God expects this of us. And, you know, when that comes that day when we're standing in front of him, he's going to ask us. God's going to say, what would you do with my son? What did you do with him? Tell me how you, what you did with him. And then he's going to, we're going to be made aware of every thought we've ever had, every word that was ever spoken, the way we treated people, and God's going to bring it up and say, what about this? What about this? You talked about Marge behind your back. I don't have any other plea. i got to say, yes, I did. But I plead the blood of Jesus Christ because I accepted that, and he's forgiven me. That's where your forgiveness lies. Your forgiveness doesn't rely on me telling Marge, sorry, I'm really just, please forgive me, Marge. What, where my forgiveness lies is in being able to say to the God of the universe, Jesus paid the price. We need to make it our goal. So in conclusion, you know, we can't lock this gospel that we have here it's a treasure we can't lock it up in a cultural straitjacket or in a pharisaic closet you all know what a pharisaic closet is you got a little peephole out there and you go oh 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 you wrote the wrong kind of clothes on out there oh oh oh, oh you didn't give enough today we need to take the gospel out of that closet and let the gospel free like it is let it run. We need to have communion with the living God and let that be so real and the Spirit of God so powerfully present that the heart of what we do becomes the joy of all the people we're called to reach. Do you understand that? way we act should be the way we're supposed to and that's how people see Jesus Christ. Because you're his representative out there. So, so I beg you today, make yourself worthy. Make yourself worthy. You can only be worthy through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we give you praise and honor as our prophet, high king, high priest, Messiah. We ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would lead us into a life and service and devotion to you. Father, may we constantly display to others love, mercy, and grace you've displayed to us. Let us be a walking testimony to Jesus Christ as we go out in our community here, as we go out in other communities, and especially if we go to be a missionary. Because I, we have not sent a missionary out yet, Lord, from this, uh, well, local missionary, but none 
other places. And, Lord, I, I know the day is coming when you're going to call on us. And I just look forward to that day when you call on us. And I just pray that you have raised up someone worthy of that. So, Lord, I just pray that our days would be filled with worship of you and that we would always have that love, that, that dependence, that, that, that just in, invades our body and, and we can't help but it oozing out of our body and, and going to the people that are surrounding us. And so we want to be seen as followers of Jesus Christ, a royal priesthood to bring the word of Jesus Christ to a dying world. And Lord, we are a dying world. We're rapidly dying. We're on our last gasp right now, Lord. So Lord, give us strength. Give us the audacity to step out in the name of Jesus Christ today and bless those who are willing to do that. Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you for everything you've done for us, everything you're doing for us now, and everything you're going to do in the future, Father. And we just give you all praise, all honor, and all glory you so richly deserve. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you all. Go in Jesus. Now, you better be with him now, Sarge. I, I've ridden with you. Oh, no, I kept my eyes closed most of the time. I love you too, man. Got to. Got to. Let's see if I can make it back to where I'm going. What did I do?